No common sense, no compassion, no care, bad training. A police officer surprises a couple, then shoots their dog. I can't make sense, not just of the, of the decision to shoot this dog. Their attorney says it speaks to a larger problem within Loveland PD. We're well beyond saying this is a bad apple or this is a coincidence. Costly technology used by Denver police. ShotSpotter facing questions over its effectiveness. Tonight we go in depth on whether it's worth the price tag. Um, it's kind of like we're reliving the past. Fighting on the front lines of the pandemic. We've seen our ICU here in this facility go from being at pretty minimal capacity to being full. A nurse tells Denver 7 his team is at the end of their rope. And for the fifth time in five years, the Broncos are starting the season with a new quarterback. I'm just happy that I get an opportunity. First tonight, Loveland police under scrutiny again this evening, this time for a shooting that killed a family pet. And tonight that family is suing, claiming what happened to them is indicative of a larger problem within the police force. With our top story, here's Denver 7, CB Cotton. When an empty parking lot becomes a place of peril, you have a problem. This is a real ongoing issue out of Loveland. At least that's how attorney Sarah Schelke sees it. I can't make sense not just of, of the decision to shoot this dog. Why did you have to shoot him? He's fine, he's a puppy. Get to your truck. But that's the decision made by Loveland police officer Matthew Grasshorn on June 29th, 2019. According to the lawsuit, a couple parked in the back of this parking lot. They say they were painting an ice box for their firewood delivery business. They had their three dogs with them and they let them out to play. What they didn't know, the owner of this building, he had called police. Apparently this business owner had a remote camera he was watching on and he said they're not anywhere near my dumpster but just go see what they're doing to make sure they don't mess with my dumpster. Body camera video released on Wednesday shows Officer Grasshorn exiting his car. Whirlwind of terrible conditions from Loveland police that led to the killing of this family's pet. The video then shows two of the family dogs approach him. The officer shoots one of them named Herkmer. Shelke says the dog was euthanized four days later. Colorado has the Dog Protection Act and it requires it's supposed to at least a, a heightened additional amount of training um, for police officers so that they're not just gunning dog, dogs down the first second they see one. I'm not in the business to get bit. The lawsuit filed against the officer, his supervisor, and the police chief alleges many things. To include that the officer could have got back in his patrol car or used less lethal force, that Herkimer displayed no signs of aggression, and that officers lied about the situation. I'm thinking about... Uh, vicious dog or okay. a, a, you know, a dog charge Yeah, uh, for, for that. Somehow all of us citizens, we're all making it from point A to point B, not gunning each other's dogs down. He's a dog pit bull going to come yeah. to bite me. I don't take the chances. I have to do what's going to work. See what this officer saw in this video and think you need to shoot that dog twice. You shouldn't be a police officer. Soon after the incident, Loveland police said Officer Grasshorn's actions were justified and within policy. The lawsuit alleges the officer's actions weren't. And Shelke believes the entire department needs an overhaul. They are not changing their behavior um, despite being recorded. In Loveland, I'm CB Cotton, Denver 7. And Denver 7 reached out to Loveland police for comments several hours ago, and we have not heard back. Also in Loveland tonight, police have released body camera video from an officer shooting a 19 year old. Police say officers were called to a home last Monday for a report of a man experiencing a mental health crisis and trashing a home as well. A body cam video shows an officer encountering 19 year old Alexander Domina in the backyard of the home, holding also a knife. That officer calmly asked Domina to put the knife down. You put the knife down for me and let's just talk, man. Just talk to me, bro. Domina refuses, moves toward the officer. The officer tells him several times to stop. And when Domina appears to be lunging toward the officer, the officer fires. And we're going to show that moment to you now. And it, it's tough to see. Do not come near me. Don't come near me. One at gunpoint, he's not stopping. Don't come near me. Stop. Stop, Alex. Stop, man. Don't make. Domina survived. His attorney tells Denver 7 he has now had five surgeries, remains in critical condition, and tonight the officer is on paid leave. That is standard procedure following a shooting like this. Fort Collins police are leading this investigation. 
Costly technology used by Denver police to combat gun crimes is now facing questions over its effectiveness. Shot Spotter is a service that's been used by Denver PD since 2015. The technology uses sensors to detect gunfire, alerting police to help them respond faster and catch those behind the trigger. But a new watchdog report says Shot Spotter is not working as well as it should. Now, going in depth here, Chicago's Inspector General examined the, that city's use of Shot Spotter, and the agency found out of 50,000 Shot Spotter activations between January 1st, 2020, and May 31st of this year. Only about 9% produced evidence that a gun related crime had taken place. So what about the use of shot spotter here in Denver? Going even further in depth, data from DPD shows from 2015 through November of last year, there were more than 11,000 shot spotter alerts and those alerts resulted in 362 total arrests and 353 guns recovered. That means 6% of activations led to either an arrest or a gun being recovered. Denver police defend the use of ShotSpotter, calling it a valuable tool in helping to speed police response to gunfire, locate gunshot victims and physical evidence, and provide investigators with information. DPD pays ShotSpotter uh, nearly $850,000 annually for use of this technology. COVID-19 is forcing more grades at STEM School Highlands Ranch to go virtual. The school says students in second, third, fourth, and fifth grades now will all move to distance learning because of an outbreak among students. Those students will stay remote through Labor Day weekend. Now, students in first and sixth grade were already online following multiple positive tests in those grades. Now, first graders are set to go back Friday. Sixth graders will return next week. And the outbreak at STEM School Highlands Ranch comes as the school mask debate rages across Colorado. And Governor Polis has not issued a mask mandate for schools, leaving that decision up to the districts. And during a press conference today, the governor said the state may need to re-examine its steps if COVID keeps forcing kids out of the, out of the classroom. There are some school districts that uh, without mask requirements that are able to stay in person, but if they lose that ability over time and they go online, uh, I think it's time for a serious conversation to say, you can't just go online and not have in-person classes. Uh, simply because you're not implementing mask wearing. In just the last week, the state health department has classified 11 schools as active outbreak sites. Four are in Douglas County, Mortensen Elementary in Jeffco, Turnberry Elementary in Brighton 27J, and Ralph Moody Elementary in Littleton are also reported clusters. It has been nearly 18 months since the first cases of COVID-19 were confirmed here in Colorado. But for many of those on the front lines of this pandemic, the past year and a half has felt more like a lifetime. And now with cases rising among the unvaccinated, one Colorado nurse tells Denver 7's Eddie Guajardo that he and others are nearing their breaking point. The overall feeling is a sense of dread. For more than a year and a half, 12 hours a day, three days a week. David Keller, a registered nurse, suits up to care for patients at UC Health in Aurora. The most difficult assignment? It's picking back up. The intensive care unit for COVID-19 patients. I've seen people that are younger than I am who have no medical history that come in and end up on the ventilator. Colorado is experiencing a surge in hospitalizations not seen since January. In April, the governor declared a fourth wave. We've now surpassed those confirmed and suspected cases. Across the state, 84% of ICU beds are in use. 207 patients with COVID-19 are hospitalized at UC Health Hospitals, more than triple than July. We've seen our ICU here in this facility go from being at pretty minimal capacity to being full. A sight and feeling fueling frustration. It's kind of like we're reliving the past. <laughs> They're as sick as when we started all this off, if not sicker. I mean, and it's have, taking a toll. We're seeing nurse burnout at an all time high. We're seeing people leave the profession entirely just because of the strain that it's put on us. David, a husband and father, even considered a career change. We want to help. We want to do our part in all of this. But at the same time, there's a breaking point. And I think we're kind of towing the line right now. As the stress, the trauma, and the fear of exposing his family weighs on his conscience. I've probably seen at least a dozen people pass. 
Powell's once thanked the health care heroes. At the beginning, I think we all felt like we were fighting this good fight. A fight dragged on by unvaccinated patients now fighting for their lives. You don't necessarily feel heroic anymore in your, in your fight. It almost is like we've become kind of the workhorses. Addy Guajardo, Denver 7. And taking a closer look now at where Colorado stands when it comes to vaccinations, the state says 67% of Coloradans eligible for the vaccine are fully vaccinated. 73% have gotten at least one dose. Well, FEMA is providing $7.6 million toward Colorado's COVID-19 response, and that money will be used for outreach efforts for media campaigns and staffing of the state health department. FEMA now has given Colorado $960 million in funds during this pandemic. We had a brief break from the heat today, but there's a whole lot of 90s coming up in the seven days. He's running for his life. Coming up, an Aurora man races against the clock to get his family out of Afghanistan. He can't go home because there's people actively looking for him right now. Coaches say they were shown the door because they're gay. Denver 7 viewers have some thoughts. 